This is a recording of the UNM Clean Room Safety Orientation presentation. This is to be used when a live presentation is not available for you. This is a requirement to go through the safety orientation and pass the safety exam prior to being allowed entry into the MTTC Clean Room. The MTTC is the Manufacturing Training and Technology Center. It's located at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're going to cover six different sections of the safety and protocols for entry into our clean room and to be able to work safely in our clean room environment. We're going to cover introductions and what is a clean room, clean room entry and exit procedures, emergency protocols, chemical safety overview, general clean room safety, and to summarize everything, we're going to have a few slides of what's wrong with this picture. So we have a few staff technologists, Mark Hoffheins and Richard Marchant. They have a combined experience of over 50 years in semiconductors. They've worked at places like Intel and Philips Semiconductors. I'm the fab manager, Matthias Plyle. I have 12 years experience in the semiconductor industry as process and engineer, uh, process engineer and equipment engineer. I've also worked as um, clean room manager and currently am the clean room manager at the MTTC. My boss is Dr. John Wood. He's the director of the manufacturing engineering program and the Manufacturing Training and Technology Center. We are both professors in the Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of New Mexico. Safety is everyone's responsibility. So hopefully by the end of these presentations, you'll be familiar with the clean room protocols, know how to dress to work in a clean room, know the emergency evacuation protocols, understand chemical safety, and understand waste disposal. As well, I have an idea of how the fire extinguishers work and what type of fire extinguisher. Some of you may not know what a clean room is. A clean room is just that. It's a really clean room. So we characterize clean rooms by the number of particles there are in a unit volume. The cleaner the room, the harder it is to keep it clean. Our MTTC clean room is an ISO class six clean room or a class 1000 or better clean room. Depends which standards you're using to describe the class of the clean room. What this means is that there are no more than a thousand half micron and larger particles per cubic foot of volume of air. So perhaps this graphic can better explain the different classes of clean rooms. So the rule of thumb the allowable particle size should not exceed half the minimum feature size. So if you're in a clean room and you're making two micron size structures and that's as small as you're going to go, then you, you don't need a clean room that's as clean as if you're making a half a micron structure in your clean room. So your house at, at home is approximately 100,000. It's a class of 100,000. So that means we have 100,000 particles per cubic foot um, that are half a micron or bigger. Again, our, our clean room is a class 1,000. And in fact, if we went to full bunny suits, we'd probably be better than a class 100. Intel, for example, has a class 1 or better clean room, which means they only have one particle. And they typically will use a different scale as well, 0.3 microns or bigger. So looking at this graphic, you can see the different classes of clean room, All right? So class one, class 10, class 100, class 1,000, class 10,000, class 100,000. And you can see how the particle size varies with the maximum number of particles per cubic foot. So if you have a class one clean room, that means you're on this scale. And as the particle sizes get bigger, you have fewer of them. And it goes in a logarithmic scale. So this is a log-log plot. 
So take some time and look at the lecture notes and try to understand what this actually means. So you can predict how many particles of a certain size you have based on the class. So for example, we're a class 10,000, so we're on this line. So that means particles that are about 5 or half a micron, 0.5 microns, are gonna, we're going to have a 1,000 or so of those particles. But if we start counting particles that are only a micron in size, we're going to have something like 200 particles per cubic foot. And if we start counting particles that are um, on the order of two microns or bigger, we're only going to have something on the order of 60 or so particles per cubic foot. So one wants to keep particle contamination to a minimum in a clean room. So when you're processing electronic parts, for example, particles are like large boulders to those devices. So think about large boulders falling on your car. It's not going to run very well. Particles cause defects in electronic circuits and physical geometry. MEMS devices are microelectromechanical systems, so it combines electronics with moving parts. So you can imagine if a particle lands on a moving part, such as a, a small gear or a cantilever or a micromembrane, it can disturb the way that part is supposed to work. So if you look at the corner here, you can see a spider mite. And if you look closely, this is a Sandia image. You can see the spider mite interacting with a flip mirror. This here is a gear. These are comb drives. Comb drives drives this lecture in this direction. And we have another set of comb drives over on the right side. Drives the lecture in the orthogonal direction, causing this very small gear to go in a circle. This gear has gear teeth that engage with the rack. So here's the rack. So as this turns, it pushes on this plate. And this will actually flip up. The, these are anchors here and here. These are hinges. So this flip mirror will flip up in this orientation. as the rack pushes this mirror in the direction of the arrow. So that's pretty cool. You may ask, what are the particle sources? Where do they come from? Well, quite frankly, the dirtiest thing in a clean room are people. People produce a lot of skin particles. They also produce mobile metal ions that get on our skin, like sodium is a common one, and it goes from the fingers to the gloves, the saliva, when we cough, we can expel these particles, and they can end up on our products. Another source is, of course, paper and pens, so we have special paper, cleaner paper, that doesn't produce as many particles as regular paper that you might find in an office. And the pens typically have low sodium content and low metal content. So we will provide you with special paper and pens if you need it. Uh, nowadays, most people take an iPad in or a laptop computer. If you do that, you need to wipe it down before entering the clean room. So you always have to wipe down anything that is entering or re-entering the clean room from the outside. So that's typically done by putting a little isopropyl alcohol on a clean room wipe and wiping down your cell phone or your laptop. That removes the particles and the oils from your hands that may have deposited on your gadget. And we'll show you how to do that. So we use very clean water when rinsing our product from chemical processing. This is called deionized water. 
The ionized water goes through a filtration system first, and this is city water treated that comes into the MTTC. We do additional cleaning to the city water. We filter it so we get the particles out of it, and we also put it through a carbon filter. Then we go through reverse osmosis. That takes out most of the, the trace elements that you may find in water. And then we remove the ions with a deionization system. And finally, there is a UV kill. So the water goes through a quartz tube. And within that quartz tube, there, there's lighting that um, provides you UV light to the uh, flowing water. And it actually will kill any bacteria that might still be left in the water. You can see what the resistivity is. So when we deionize water, we increase the resistivity. So there are fewer ions, and then resistivity goes up. This is an analog to the dissolved solids in parts per million that you can find in water at different levels of deionization. Our clean room is at 18 mega ohms, which is the best you can get, and we maintain it at 18 mega ohms. So we're very proud of it. So we have a, we've established we have a very clean area to work, we have clean water. So what happens in a clean room other than having clean water and clean air? Well, we use a lot of chemicals to alter the surface of the silicon wafers, create electronic circuits or other physical geometries. We can also layer different materials on our silicon wafers and create structures. So we use a variety of acids and bases and solvents that are used to process these wafers. Some of these chemicals are known to affect an unborn fetus. So if you think you're pregnant, you should probably shouldn't go into a cleaner. Now, we have done a really good job in mitigating any trace fumes and that sort of thing. And if you wear your protective personal equipment when working with chemicals, you should be safe. But it's up to the individual. And we always like to side on, on being safer than not safer. And so to remove the risk of an unborn fetus, we suggest if you think you're pregnant or you are pregnant, you may not want to work in an environment that has chemicals around you. Part two, entering and exiting procedures for our clean room. Before entering the clean room, you should really plan what you're going to do. You don't want to be going in and out of the clean room because you forgot your notes or you forgot your clean room notebook or, or whatnot. You also want to make sure that you visited the restroom before going in, especially if you're part of a class. Um, we typically um, have to have two staff members with every class in the clean room just to make sure everything goes well and everybody's safe. So when someone needs to leave, then we lose one of our staff members. So try to plan your day. Um, all non-computer controlled operations that you may do in the clean room, for example, something with a hot plate, um, you want to be there during the entire time. You don't want to take a break while something is on a hot plate and processing, for example, a wafer that might be in a beaker of um, piranha, which we use to clean. Piranha is sulfuric and peroxide mixed together, and we typically will use that at, at a high temperature by putting the beaker on a hot plate. Since that's not a computer-controlled um, system, we require you to stay with your process until it is done and safe and all the chemicals are put away. Um, also, oh, never ever eat or drink in the lab. Right? For one thing, we don't want particles from your food or from your drinks in the clean room. And also, you can transfer chemicals and have another pathway to bringing in chemicals into your body, which is by eating, by ingestion. So no eating or drinking. So typically, our gowning procedure includes putting on a hairnet, um, a face shield or a face mask, 
Also, we call it a beard bag. Um, blue booties, cover your shoes. A smock, which is Tyvek um, cleaner smock. And latex or nitrile gloves. And the last thing you need to put on is the safety glasses. So once you're properly gowned up, you can go into the cleaner. Every item that you take into the cleaning room has to be wiped, off, wiped down with isopropyl alcohol and water prior to going in. So we have a solution of IPA, and you're welcome to use that and our wipes in the change area to wipe down your phones and laptops, as we mentioned earlier. If you happen to be a smoker, um, please don't smoke for 15 to 20 minutes before entering the cleaning room and get a drink at the water fountain. Um, it's been studied that smokers will exhale particles for a long time after their last cigarette, and we don't want those particles in our clean room. Also, drinking some water at the water fountain will help rinse your mouth and reduce probability of contaminating the air with your particles. Once you're inside the clean room, you don't want to open your smock or gloves, take your gloves off to get something out of your pockets. So once you wipe down your, la your laptop or, in this case, your cell phone, you definitely don't want to put it back in your pocket. So you will carry your cell phone into the clean room if you decide to bring it. Pictures are allowed. However, we encourage you to make sure, in fact, require you to make sure that the flash is off. We do have some flash sensors in the clean room. They basically look for flames. And if the, the flame sensor, the flash sensor gets confused, flash from your phone, you can end up setting off the fire alarm and the fire department will be called. Always work with a buddy when you're in the clean room, especially when working with chemicals. We do allow experienced people in the clean room by themselves if they're not working on a chemical bench. And always, always wear proper protective equipment, PPE, personal protective equipment, when working with chemicals. And we'll... So, what do you wear? Well, you should come to the clean room wearing long pants, closed-toed shoes, shirts with sleeves, Short sleeves are preferred, but you can wear long sleeves. The long pants protect your legs in case there's a splash, and the closed-toed shoes do the same in case there's a spill or if you drop something on your foot. We will provide you with a hairnet, shoe covers, a face mask, a smock, gloves, either latex or nitrile, and safety glasses that are UV-absorbing. We do work with some equipment that has some UV lights in it, so we want to make sure you wear UV absorbing safety glasses. Do not bring your own safety glasses that may or may not be UV absorbing. And let us know if you're allergic to latex and we'll find you some nitrile gloves and also a hood um, that does not have any latex bands in it. You are not to wear contact lenses or makeup. Makeup because it's a source of particles. And contact lenses can fuse to your eye if you're exposed to certain chemicals and get them in your eye. So please wear your glasses on the day you come in. Entering the clean room um, requires you to walk over some sticky pads. So try to take five to ten very small steps on the sticky uh, pads, they are designed to take particles off the bottom of your shoe. Once in the, in the change area, you're going to put your clean room attire on. So start with your blue booties, your shoe covers. Then you want to put your hairnet on. You want to put your face cover over that. And that's kind of like a mask, a surgical mask. We have that type. And we also have what we call a beard bag. And you'll see those when you come. We'll point those out to you. Uh, we have the latex or nitrile gloves. We have a Tyvek smock that you can wear, and safety glasses are provided. You want to check in the mirror to make sure you have everything on. You can also check your buddies. Uh, students sometimes forget components, and I've actually gone in the cleaner 
without safety glasses because I wear regular glasses and I just don't think about it sometimes. So I appreciate it when someone tells me I forgot my safety glasses and I'll go out and get my safety glasses. Okay? So every time you go in and out of the clean room, you should change your shoe covers, your hairnet, and face mask. Smocks are disposed of every semester, um, so students, you know, will you will get a new smock at the beginning of the semester. Um, we share those, and if you notice that any of the smocks are damaged, sometimes they tear. We'll go ahead and we'll throw them away and get you another smock. So when you have all of your clean room attire on, you will look like the fellow in the photo. So let's take a look at him closely. All right. He's got his, his face mask or beard. We used to call these beard bags, face masks, right? Face cover. He has his hair net. Okay. I'm assuming these are his own safety glasses, but Probably not, so he has a safety violation here. This is a very old photo, so we'll have to update it. You see it as his nitrile gloves. He's, he's using a different style smock than we use now. This is more of the traditional clean room bunny suit smock. So that's what you're going to be looking like. So if you're one of our industry partners that use the clean room periodically or often for doing prototyping work and research and development, or you're a graduate student and you do a lot of work in our clean room, we expect you to clean up after yourself. So please clean up after yourself. Make sure you put all your wafers in the designated shelf. We can give you some space there to put your wafers. Um, if you've used beakers for various chemical processes, some people use beakers, some use the wet sinks. Please clean up after yourself and put them away. Clean up all the chemical drag out, resist drips, and wipes. So as you're doing processing, you may drip on the, on the surface of the um, chemical bench you're working at. Please do a wipe after that and make sure you wipe up all of your drips and, and drag out. The reason for doing that is you know what that chemical is. If one of us follows you at that station, we have to assume that's a very nasty chemical, perhaps buffered oxide edge, piranha, hydrofluoric acid, and that sort of thing. So you're required to clean up after yourselves. And we have wipes, and, and we will show you how to do it. If you don't know how, don't worry. We're here to help and keep you safe. Also, you don't want to be leaning up against something or bumping into a, a drip and you don't know what it is and then your hand starts to itch later or worse burn okay chemicals are stored in designated storage areas so we don't mix um, caustics with acids and we don't, and we don't mix solvents with with caustics and that, that sort of thing um, and then when you finally leave the, the facility after cleaning up after yourself, you want to de down in the gowning room in the reverse order that you were gowned in. So we usually do our shoes first when we're putting stuff on. And then, you know, we put our gloves and our, and our hairnet and our, our face mask. Um, and then we put the smock and the glasses on. So when you get out of the clean room, you want to go in the reverse order. So you typically will take off your... Um, your hairnet and your face mask um, and your shoes. You can do that after you take your gloves off um, if you like. And then you want to hang up your smock and put your safety glasses back in the safety glass cabinet. Okay? If you don't follow procedures, you may lose uh, clean room access and privileges. So please follow all procedures. If you have any questions about how to follow the procedures properly, we're here to help you, and we will train you on that. Part three, emergency. In the event of evacuation, usually there's an alarm that goes off, and they're very loud. And there's lots of flashing lights, so you can't miss it. Um, unless something is like, burning like crazy, you can go ahead and, and make sure you turn off their, your hot plates and 
most and the processes you're running if possible in an orderly manner and then you can leave with your partner and other lab members as soon as you can. Don't worry about degowning. It's not a big deal. You don't have to go through the change room and, and take your gown off. You can go straight out through the emergency exits and to the outside and we'll tell you where the um, gathering point is. It's actually at Base Heart and Bradbury. There's Base Heart and Bradbury, the sign. And we show you that in our safety tour. If the alarm is active, such as a fire alarm, you don't have to worry about calling 911. It's been done. Just get to a safe area and get to the gathering area. The gather gathering area is close to the parking garage, the MTTC parking garage at the corner of Base Heart and Bradbury. And we'll point it out during our um, physical. Now, I don't expect you to remember this graphic when you're in the clean room, but basically I'll explain to you how it works. Um, let me get my bearings here. Okay, so this is the entry point for the change area. So you come into the clean room here. Here's one of our aisles. So you come in from here into the changing area and you change here. These are all called bays, so bay one, bay two, bay three, etc. from this side down. And there are doors on each end of the bays. Here's a door, here's a door, here's a door. This is pointing north, so we call this aisle here the north aisle. Okay, and if there's any problem in the clean room, you typically will exit out to the north aisle and you can take this exit here or you can take this exit here and walk across here and then come out. Or you can come up and around and go down um, this street here to the Base Heart and Bradbury assembly point. Um, if these are blocked for some reason, if there's a fire here, maybe out in the cub, you know, one of the, the um, ventilation system motors caught fire or something and you see smoke or things are over in this area, you don't want to walk to the smoke and then try to get out. You can also go in this aisle here and come out back to the loading dock. And we'll show you that as well. Okay, so usually one of us is there, Mark or Richard's there, and they'll help you find your way out. So here's another view of the outside. This is the physical building here. You'll usually come in this way to attend class or come into the building. There's also an entrance here. If you have swipe card access, you can come in here as well. But typically we walk up this sidewalk here and go in this front door and then we go down the stairs and the clean room is over here. Okay, so this is the this is the nitrogen tank which you'll see on the view. This is the loading dock here. Okay, so you'll either come out this way right here and walk around, and then that's our assembly point. Okay. Or you'll walk out this way in the cub, and you can push open the gate here and come out this way. Or you can come out through the loading dock back here, walk along the loading dock, go down these stairs, and then cross the street. Be careful when you cross the street, because this is a street. You're gonna be parking in the parking structure, and we'll give you some codes and things like that so you don't have to pay, okay? So tenants don't have to pay and visitors don't have to pay and we don't make students pay if they're taking a class in our clean room. All right, so that gives you a basic layout of the assembly point and this is a close-up of it. So um, it's not too hard. To so continuing on the emergency exit protocols, most exit doors have contact information sheets on them. You can rip those off the door and take them with you. That way you can you can call me or Dr. Wood or UNM Security. Usually we call UNM Security if there's an emergency and they will direct the emergency response teams from Albuquerque Fire Department to the building. The reason is, is if you call 911 and you get a 911 operator, they may not know what the MTTC is or where it's located or what door to enter and that sort of thing. The police officers that work for UNM, the UNM police, are the best ones to call and direct the fire 
um, response to the building. Uh, if it's a medical emergency and you call 911 from one of the phones inside the clean room, you will get UNM police. Um, ideally, you should call the UNM police and tell them there's an emergency at the MTTC and they will know where that building is and they will be able to direct the ambulance and the paramedics to the right place. Okay, so always call UNM police, UNM security. And the phone numbers are on the, on the cards that are. You definitely want to get out of the lab and, and meet at the designated area in front of the parking garage. The reason we don't want you to just go home if there's a fire alarm is because you may have heard something, smelled something, seen something that's important to the paramedics and the, and the firemen that come. Um, if you're if you leave without telling anyone, uh, we may still think you're inside the clean room. And now you're putting the life of a fireman and a first responder at risk to go in and look for you. So you certainly don't want to do that. So we need to account for everyone that was in the clean room, and we need to also be around to um, let the fire chiefs know what we saw, heard, and smelled so they can get a better handle on you know, what kind of chemicals are involved and that sort of thing. We want to keep everyone safe. Okay. So typically, if you're a student, you'll be with us. If you're an individual contractor, you may be in the clean room by yourself. So you should know your way out. And you need to also go to the assembly point because Mark and Richard will know that you're in the clean room. And we want to make sure you made it out okay. It's critical you remain at the assembly site. Okay, so please stay there until you're done. So what's more common in industrial um, environments than, than a fire or a chemical leak or a gas leak um, is a medical emergency. So people are diabetic, they have heart disease um, and that sort of thing. Some people get panic attacks if they're in a yellow room area or you know, people can have um, seizures and that sort of thing. So medical emergencies actually happen and have a higher probability of happening than um, some of the fire type of uh, emergencies. So if someone faints or becomes unconscious, you, you want to go through the standard procedure and have someone call 911. If they don't have a pulse and, and you're CPR trained, you can start CPR. Okay, but it's always important to call 911 or call UNM police. Okay, and this will give you uh, the emergency response personnel will be able to come. Okay, if you're the only person around, call for assistance first and then start CPR. Because you need to have uh, someone coming. We now have um, red um, buttons in several of the bays. And if you push the red button, the alarm will go off in the office area. So Diane or Arden, or Mark, or Richard will hear that and get a hold of Mark and Richard to go check out what's going on in the fab in case they're not working in there at the time of the emergency. So please make sure you do that. And we'll point that out in our, um, in our safety. So if you're trained and the person is unconscious and has stopped breathing and has no pulse, then you you may place the AED patches on them to restart their heart. Um, many people are trained in AED and CPR, and we have AED um, systems in a couple of locations in the clean room. One is in the change area, um, so you can use it. Um, Mark and Richard are also trained on it, and those are periodically checked and are, are functional, so we make sure they're, they're working. Okay, never uh, move a person unless it's not safe to remain in the immediate area because you may actually cause more harm than good. Another type of emergency um, is a chemical exposure. So if you use personal protective equipment properly, you probably won't be subjected to any chemical exposures. However, um, it can happen. A glove could have a hole in it or tear, uh, you may drop something into a bath and it could splash. 
Um, usually that, though, you're protected with the personal protective equipment. Or you may just have a bad day and forget to put on your chemical gloves and reach into something without thinking and get a chemical burn. So if that happens, you'll push the red button, which will alert the MTTC staff. Um, if it's a hand, a forearm, or foot exposure, you can carefully remove and dispose of cam uh, contaminated items. Um, if your buddy, who should be there if you're doing chemical work, can put on some chemical gloves and help you degown without cross-contaminating themselves. Okay, and then you can rinse the effective area for 15 minutes. So if it's your hand, you can go to the restroom and do that. If it's your entire body, you'll probably want to stand under the, the shower that's in the clean room. And you want to remove the affected um, clothing. So if it's on your sleeve, you want to take your shirt off. If it's on your pants, you want to take your pants off. Okay. Um, you want to go to UNMH. Um, after you rinse, and or you can go to the shack. That's a student health um, and counseling center, and they'll do an assessment. Um, if it's if it's hydrofluoric acid or buffered oxide ash, you definitely want to have um, calcium gluconate treatment on the affected area so that the HF doesn't continue to travel through your skin to your bones. Um, UNM police may be called to assist you. Depending on the severity, EMS may also be called. Um, if you do not go to SHAC or UNMH to be checked out after a chemical exposure incident, we will send the police to your dorm room and come get you and take you forcibly to be checked out. It's in your best interest to do that. If you are exposed to any chemical or injured, you must be checked out by medical personnel. I'm not a medical personnel. I can't say, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. Okay, you will get a written report, and you will be give, giving that written report to the fab manager, which happens to be me, and I will write an incident report up, and it'll go in front of the safety um, committee at UNM, and every incidents of any sort of incident of, a, of an emergency in a lab on campus is reviewed. So we're looking for ways to improve the safety and make sure we have everything covered. Uh, you won't be able to go back in the fab until we figured out what happened and root cause is determined. And then we may retrain you and allow you back in unless you willingly did not follow safety protocols, and we can't trust you anymore, and you won't be allowed in. So please follow safety protocols, and if you forget or or someone coaches you, take it, um, take it well, and please be respectful for, to our technicians. We're out to um, help you. If you forgot to put your gloves on, and we happen to be there, we'll remind you, hey, you need to put your gloves on, your chemical gloves, and, and whatnot. So, um, don't argue. Just say, oh, thank you very much for letting me know. Um, you know, don't don't try to say, well, I'm only using water, or I'm only using a weak acid or whatever. You, we don't know what you're using. And uh, Okay, we have some fire suppression systems in the clean room. We have a solvent bench where we use things like acetone and isopropyl alcohol and methanol. These are all flammables. So that um, solvent bench, um, which you can identify because it's stainless steel rather than polypropylene plastic, which is used for caustics. So the stainless steel bench has a uh, carbon dioxide fire suppression system in it. So if it senses smoke or um, heat or a flash inside the solvent bench, um, the CO2 suppression system will turn on. And that typically will um, basically pump a lot of carbon dioxide into the solvent um, bench. Of course, you will need to leave the clean room when this happens because you can't breathe carbon dioxide very long without passing out and you can actually die. Uh, make sure you walk away from the CO2 cloud. 
ensure that your buddies all know that this is happening. I believe the fire alarm goes off so everybody will hear it. Um, so please follow all of those exit procedures we already talked about. Or, there are also halotron fire extinguishers located throughout the lab. The halotron fire extinguishers are designed to be safe with an electrical fire. So halotron is often used in server farms and things like that. So if there's a fire, instead of using uh, water to put the fire out, they use halotron gas. Of course, you don't want to be hanging around. So typically when those fire alarms go off, they give you a certain amount of time to exit the room. And then the halotron will start coming out of the out of the um, systems, the nozzles, and of course you won't live just breathing halotron. So, um, so halotron is an acceptable fire extinguisher for flammables or electrical fires, and it's a BC type fire extinguisher. Other BC type fire extinguishers are dry chemical fire extinguishers. But those would contaminate the lab more than necessary. Here's a listing of the types of fire extinguishers. We have the A-type, which is for ordinary solid combustibles, something you may have in your shed, that sort of thing. You have the B-type for flammables or combustible liquids, and that can include cleaner and chemicals. Um, you may want a B-type in your uh, in your garage if you work around you know, gasoline and, and things like that. A C type is for electrical equipment. Okay, so a BC may be the best if you use a circular saw and you have flammables that you use if, your cabin, if you make cabinets or something. So definitely make sure you get the proper fire extinguisher for your home, hobby shops. And then there's some really oddball um, type of fire extinguishers for combustible metals. We don't use these metals in our clean room in their pure form, so they're not um, combustible. But things like magnesium, titanium, potassium, and sodium you know, in their pure forms are very combustible metals, and they're hard to put out, so you have to use a D-type uh, fire extinguisher. And we already talked about holotron. Okay, and the CO2 fire. Part four, chemical safety. So chemical safety is really important. And in order to work safely in an environment where you're using chemicals every day, it's best to read the um, safety data sheets. These used to be called NSDSs, material safety data sheets. And if you look at the photograph here, Okay, that's what they are called in these binders. We still keep our safety data sheets in these binders. Um, every time we bring in a new chemical into the clean room, we add it to the binder. We never take any out of the binder. And this is so people who work in the clean room can look up the chemicals that they'll be working with and read about the exposure limits and what type of safety equipment they need to wear to use the chemicals safely. Okay, so you want to read the safety data sheets for whatever chemical you're working with. Understand the flashpoints for the solvents we are using. You definitely don't want to heat up um, solvents to within um, 20 degrees or so of the flashpoint because it becomes extremely dangerous. Any kind of spark or ignition source can cause a fire. Um, we also work with things like hydrofluoric acid. It's called buffered oxide ash. So oh, it's buffered, it's a buffered solution of hydrofluoric. This is not good for people. Okay, so we're very careful on how we use it. For those of you who are just taking the clean room experience and doing the art wafer, for example, um, I will do all the buffered oxide etching for you, or one of my um, trained lab TAs will be doing it for you. Okay, so you won't do it until you're properly trained. If you're a graduate student, you will be trained you will probably use buffered oxide X at some point. And uh, we will help you with that, and we will be with you the first few times you use it. Uh, any kind of chemical contact, let the lab techs know. Mark and Richard will are our first line of defense, and then they will let me know and so that we can follow all the protocols necessary to document what happened 
and make sure you get the correct um, medical treatment and review. Okay, so HF is the one we're worried about the most. Um, you know, of course, sulfuric acid is bad and uh, hydrogen peroxide and developer are all bad for you as well. But the hydrofluoric is dangerous. Um, so we will rinse the affected area for 15 minutes with water and then apply calcium gluconate solve to that. Solve is like a um, cream, but it has calcium gluconate in it. So that will be done, and then you'll be taken to the UNM emergency room uh, to be evaluated and to get further calcium treatments. So now with the internet, you can find almost every safety data sheet you're interested in online. So I highly recommend if you're working with chemicals at home, on uh, stripping cabinetry or, or doing those kind of things, um, please look up the SDSs and make sure you understand the hazards involved. So what are some things in an SDS? This is a safety data sheet. Well, it's more than one sheet, typically. Um, you'll have information about its identification. So what is it called? Maybe some common names. Okay. Um, then you'll have information about the composition and other ingredients that might be used that. Uh, first aid measures. Some of them is, you know, if you breathe it in and you feel bad, go to an area and, and breathe fresh air for a while. Um, or if you get it on your skin, rinse for 15 minutes and, and monitor your skin and make sure you don't have any you know, long-lasting burns. And if you do, then you might want to go see a health professional. How to fight a fire with this material. Um, what do you do if you spill it on the floor? And how do you clean it up? Um, if that ever happens, then please let Mark and Richard know, and they will they will uh, take the lead in a, in a spill containment and clean up. Now, how do you store it? How do you handle it? Do you put it in a glass container, a plastic container? You know, do you store it in the dark, in the light? Um, do you have to refrigerate it? That sort of thing. What sort of exposure controls do you need? You need a well ventilated area. That's why we have all those solid hoods. Um, do you have to wear personal protective equipment? Yeah, typically with any chemicals, we require our partners to use personal protective equipment, which includes triple trionic gloves, apron, and face shield. The other things in an SDS could be physical and chemical properties, stability and reactivity information, toxicology information. This is really important if you're going to work with a chemical over a long period of time because it might be very benign, you know, if you use it just a few times, but if you use it every single day, day after day, shift after shift, then the long-term exposure might be yeah, might cause cancer or other health effects or liver damage, that sort of thing. So, you know, um, toxicological information is good to go over, especially for materials you're going to use over a long period of time. Ecological information is now required, and that's so you don't, like, dump it out in the, in the grass, you know, when you're done using something, right? Uh, how to dispose of it properly. Uh, transport information. This is also new from the MSDSs. So you want information on the containers that tell the people who transport these chemicals what's inside and how dangerous they are. Regulatory information as well. Certain chemicals are controlled by the Department of Defense and Homeland Security for obvious reasons. And any other information that's important to make sure people using this material so we have designated benches to do different types of work. So we have a caustic bench. This is where we do our developing, typically, and we also do potassium hydroxide etching. And we'll show you that. That's in bay one. Also in bay one is what we call our acid bench. This is a, a bench that has also a fume hood. Um, it has deionized uh, quick dump rinse, just like the caustic bench does. But we typically do our acid work in there um, we do our wafer stripping in there and those sorts of things. Things where you need beakers and hot plates, usually we do that kind of work in there. We have um, a solvent bench 
we actually have two in day one. One is used um, for the coat process, so we spin on photoresist, which contains a solvent in it. So that's in a solvent bench. We also use acetone when we clean the photoresist out of the coat bowl. That's a solvent, so we keep that separate from the encaustics. Um, and then the other solvent bench we use for resisting photoresist off of wafers, you know, usually in a beaker. I use acetone followed by an IPA rinse. And then once you do the IPA rinse, then you can take it over to the quick dump rinse at the caustic bench. Uh, you don't want to mix corrosives with organics or solvents. Okay, that can cause an exothermic reaction. We actually do have a process where we mix an acid in a base. So the acid is sulfuric, the base is hydrogen peroxide. Um, that's used to, to clean organics off of wafers and put a strip photoresist, and that's called piranha etch. And it's piranha because it's not very nice to organics, which are people. So it's a good name for that process. <coughs> and that's the only time we mix an acid in a base like that. And it is exothermic, so it will heat up. So you have to be very, very careful when you use that. Now, if you spill an acid or, or caustic on you, immediately go to the safety shower, um, or you can go to the, the restroom if it's a small amount. <coughs> make sure someone comes with you and helps you, and make sure you don't cross-contaminate doorknobs and things like that on the way out. So typically, someone will help you. If you get anything in your eyes, we have eye wash stations. So you have to rinse your eye and try to hold your eye open. I suggest you take off any chemical gloves you may have on, on you um, at the time so you don't add more contaminants to your eye. This is another reason why you do not wear contacts. Make sure you and your buddy hits the red emergency button located in every bay. That way it'll call for help and you'll get Richard and or Mark to help you. And if I'm in the building, I will also come. You will be required to go to SHAC or UMH as soon as possible after an incident, and they'll check you out make sure you're okay, or if you need further treatment. For your so if we think something's been contaminated, um, we usually use pH strip to test to see if it's hot. And hot can be either you know, on one end of the scale, very acidic or very uh, alkaline. And so you can see the, the scale there. Um, a pH of 4 or less is, makes it very acidic. A pH of 9 is very basic. Normally we're around 7, so if it comes up 7, then it's either very weak or it's just deionized water. Okay, don't attempt to clean any spills on the floor by yourself. Keep others away from a spill and contact the lab personnel immediately. I actually had a class go in one time and someone saw a clear liquid on the floor. Um, it ended up being water that was condensating uh, from a pipe, but it was really good that the student noticed it, let me know, and we got Mark and Richard to come in and they took care of it. So this is what you will typically wear when you're working with chemicals in the clean room. This is required. So we have a triple trionic um, gloves, that's what's worn here, and those are over your latex or, or nitrile gloves that you wear in the fab. Okay? In this case, the person has cuffed gloves. That helps you uh, prevent fluids from, from going down your sleeve into, into, your, um, into your glove. Actually, it's from coming down the glove into, onto the sleeve. It gets caught in the cuff. Sorry, I misspoke. Okay, so triple trionic gloves. This is an acid apron. It also works for caustics, right? It's chemically um, protective. And then we wear a face shield over our safety goggles, our safety glasses. You definitely want to wear both. Um, if the face shield gets scratched up or starts to get a little bit foggy, we'll replace it. We have a plenty of these things, so we want to keep the face shields clear so you can see what you're doing, okay? So that's what you need for um, personal protective um, equipment when working with chemicals. So once again, face shield, triple trionic gloves, apron. This is actually on the test. <coughs> so 
Let me zoom in a little bit. So you can see it. Okay. So sometimes we change the style of, of the aprons, but not to worry. Um, they're all um, they all protect you. Just as a side note, you can see a little bit of light coming through back here. That's from the UV lamp source that's inside the exposure tool. That's why these safety glasses you wear are UV uh, absorbing. Okay, another important thing. When pouring acids and bases, always pour the fluid away from your body in a continuous smooth stream with no gurgling. The reason is, is you don't want it splashing. You know, if you just pour something quickly out of a uh, one gallon bottle, it's going to go glug, 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 and when it comes out, it's going to come out in various uh, spurts. That'll cause a splash. The splash could end up getting on you or getting on something, you know, uh, in the bench and later cross-contaminating either someone's product or someone else's hand or glove or whatever. Um, you never, ever submerge any body parts, including gloved hands, in a solution. So sometimes it's tempting to reach in and grab your wafer that fell inside of a tank, you know, into a tank uh, to retrieve it. But even though you have a gloved hand and it's triple trionic glove, do not ever reach into, um, into any liquid and submerge it. The glove is there just in case there's a splash, right? It's to protect you from that. Usually when you work around chemicals, you never get any chemicals on your gloves, your face shield, or your, your apron. You should never have any of that on you. Okay, it's only in the case that something slips, something falls, and splashes. Okay, so always pour fluids away from you in a smooth, steady stream. Always wear your personal protective equipment. And um, never, never submerge any part, no matter if it's protected or not, of your body into a liquid. Of course, you're going to submerge your wafers to get action and that sort of thing. Okay? So the other thing um, about pouring chemicals, you want to always uh, pour the more concentrated chemical into the less concentrated. So, for example, if you're diluting acid, you would put the water in first, and then you would pour um, the more concentrated or the acid into the water. That way, if it splashes, it's mostly water. Right? If you did it the other way around and added water and it splashed, then it would be mostly acid that, that hits you. Okay, So that's the, the thinking behind that. If you have a weak acid and you're mixing a different, more concentrated acid to it, you do the weak acid first and then the more concentrated one second. And the same goes with alkaline solutions or bases. So sometimes we have to dilute our developer. So we may want a three to one. Um, uh, ratio, you know, three parts water, one part developer. So you would pour the water first and then add the high concentrated developer to the water. So adherence to chemical safety, that's really important. If you don't adhere to safety processes and procedures, you will be barred from the cleaner. Okay, if you accidentally forget to wear your safety glasses, or, your, or put on safety gloves. Um, we will also bar you from the, from the clean room, but we will coach you and train you and allow you back in. Just depends what your attitude is, okay? Um, be open to coaching. You're new to the fab. You may forget your safety glasses one day. You may forget to put on your blue booties, that sort of thing. If we notice it, we'll happen to tell you ask you to go put it on, you'll go to the change room, put it on, come back in. No problem, right? That's called coaching, okay? Um, if you see your buddy, your classmate, or even see your professor not following the procedure or forgetting, you know, gloves or face shield or something like that, 
please remind them. I know I would appreciate it when people uh, mention that I don't, I'm not doing something right, okay? Because I want to be safe too. So it's critical to know which PPE to wear and when to wear it for all wet chemistry operations. You are required to wear caustic apron, triple trionic gloves, no matter what. So here are some more guidelines around working it with the acid and caustic wet bench. So you want to make sure all chemicals are in the appropriate containers with labels. We don't like mystery bottles of stuff. So if you happen to mix something for a specific process you're doing as a grad student or as a customer of the clean room, you are required to label that container as to what it is, the date that you um, made that solution, and your name and your cell number so we can call you and say, hey, you know, we've noticed this here for a few days. Are you going to use it or should we toss it? Okay, you got to label beakers with the chemicals you're using. We have Sharpies in there. You know, you can clean Sharpies off with methanol when you're done. You want to clean your beakers off. But while the process is going on, you want to label the beaker. So, for example, we have customers that will soak a wafer in acetone. Because it takes a long time for the acetone to diffuse and... Uh, dissolve the photoresist right, for a clean process, for example. And we may even do let you do it overnight, but you have to get our agreement first. So what you're going to do is you're going to label the container, put your name, put, put what chemical is in there. So you would write, you know, Matt Plyle, and you would write acetone, and you would write date, and um, if you know, Mark and Richard know me, so I don't have to put a cell number there. They already have it. They know Carrie, so Carrie works for 3D Glass, so they have that information. But if you're new or a grad student, then yeah, put your cell number there so they can call you and say, hey, what the heck? And you definitely want to talk to Richard and Mark if you're going to leave any kind of chemical out. Um, they'll take a look at it. They will talk to you about it, and they have to agree to letting you keep it there. Uh, we aspirate all our caustics, so those are acids and um, bases. Okay, and aspiration. Uh, is done for any kind of caustic you don't need anymore. So you'll be doing that in the develop process. So after develop, you'll be aspirating the developer out of the container, the petri dish, uh, and we'll show you how to do that. Don't adjust any exhaust ventilations. If you think the exhaust isn't strong enough, perhaps you're smelling something. It's usually an indication that the exhaust is not up to where it's supposed to be. Definitely get with Mark or Richard, and they'll take a look and make sure everything is okay. Okay, if something smells, you should probably leave with that. Okay, so occasionally we'll, we'll have a leak for example, uh, hexamethyl disilosane, it has a it has a unique smell to it. If you smell something weird, chemical, just leave. You know, um, and let Richard and Mark know, and we'll figure out what's causing it, and we'll we'll fix it. Okay. So when we have an acid or a base that we need to get rid of. Um, we don't just pour it down the drain, per se. We actually mitigate it. So we take the aspirator, which sucks up um, the caustic, okay, and mixes it with water. So we dilute it. And then that dilute solution goes down to the acid waste neutralization system we have. That automatically determines what the pH is of the solution, and it will either add acid or base to it to neutralize it. Once it's neutralized, we can let it go to the um, standard sewer line from Albuquerque. Now, remember, acid and bases are found in nature, and they're, they're fine to have, and they're a normal part. And we have hydroxides, and we have, you know, 
uh, acidic solutions in nature. We just dilute it down and neutralize it so it's uh, neutral pH. And that way it won't upset the environment and it won't upset the, you know, the sewer treatment plants either. Now, of course, you never want to pour a solvent on the drain. That's things like acetone. Uh, alcohols are okay. Those are naturally occurring as well. But something like an acetone or a solvent, you know, gasoline is, a, is considered a solvent or a flammable. Uh, those kind of things you don't pour down the drain. It's really hard for the um, systems to clean all of that out. All right, so acids include hydrofluoric acid, sulfuric acid, acidic acid, nitric acid, piranha mixture, super clean one, super clean two, um, other non-flammable corrosives. Caustics are also potassium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide. These are the bases, the alkalines, right? Um, so, sodium hydroxide and non-flammable corrosives. So, caustics are actually acids and bases. So, how do we aspirate? So, we turn on the water flow to start the aspirator. We insert the end of the aspirator hose into the chemical container. The aspirator will lift the chemical from the container through the water venturi, and then dilution occurs as the chemical is directed to the neutralization system. And we repeat, we do rinse and aspirate the chemical uh, three more times, and we shut off the aspirator, and we wet wipe and dry wipe the container and the bench. <clears throat> this is part of the test. How do we aspirate? So there are six steps involved, so learn these. I'm going to zoom in on this um, image here so you can see what it looks like. So let me point this out here. This is the venturi, so when you turn this valve on, the water flows up through the venturi. The venturi is just a constriction in the pipe. When you have a constriction in the pipe, the water will flow faster. When the water flows faster, this T part right here, and this comes all the way around, comes back down. This T here, there's a lower pressure that's involved when you have a venturi. So it's like, you know, why do you have lift on an airplane wing? It's a fluid dynamic thing. Right? So we speed up the flow right here. The T ends up having a vacuum, so it's going to want to suck up the tube into the venturi. Okay? And then the water flowing through the venturi will dilute whatever you suck up and go down the drain. And the drain goes to the acid waste neutralization system. Okay? So again, here's the valve. You turn it on. Water will flow, you take the end of this tube, which happens to be down here now, take that tube and you may pull out the chemical out of the bath that you've been using. Okay, you empty it, you flow water in there, empty it, flow water in there, empty it, do it three times so it's a 3x rinse. Okay, and then you turn the, uh, the venturi off. You have to turn the water flow off, otherwise um, you're going to drain the deionized water out of our tank. Okay? So that's pretty cool. So, that's so here's a close-up. Okay, so if you look here where that T was, okay, this is a cartoon of it. So when I turn on the Venturi, the water flows from right to left in this cartoon. It causes, and this is constricted here, see the constriction. So it causes <coughs> the fluid to flow faster here. That reduces the pressure in the tube and causes a sucking action. Okay? And that's basically all there is. So here's a close-up of it. You have the venturi, the T, right? In this case, the T is going up. Here the T is on the bottom side, but you get the So corrosives have to be stored in a corrosive cabinet. Always use proper personal protective equipment when working with any chemicals. So if you go to get a chemical out of the corrosive cabinet, you should be wearing triple trionic gloves and personal protective equipment. 
generally you won't have to do that. Mark and Richard can provide you with those chemicals or show you how to properly get those chemicals and where to retrieve it from. Remember the AAA rule, always add acid to water, never the reverse. Again, this goes back to what we were saying about pouring chemicals. You want the higher concentration chemical poured into the lower concentration chemical. Okay? So add the stronger acid or base to the weaker. So the weaker goes in the container first, and the stronger goes in the container second. Dispose of all the wipes that contain corrosive materials in the white bin labeled corrosive. Triple rinse all used corrosive bottles and dry them with a clean room wipe. So you're going to triple rinse a bottle if you empty it, and we do that with develop quite often. I do it in our class. So I'll have the last person using it to, you know, put water in it, swish it around, aspirate it out, do it again, do it a third time. Then you wipe the um, outside of the bottle with a, a wipe, make sure it's dry. Then you write on it with a Sharpie, 3X rinse. So that tells Mark and Richard that the bottle's been rinsed three times. You put the cap on it and you put it in a place um, where we collect those bottles and we'll show you where that is in the clean room. And, and that's what we do. So you never, ever want to pour any excess chemicals back into a stock bottle. So if you're done developing something, we don't want to pour the contaminated developer back into a fresh developer bottle, right? Because then the next person using it doesn't know that, and you'll cross-contaminate their product. And the etching and the developing won't happen at the same rate. So you will ruin any further... Um, processing that you could do with that material. Okay? Now, if you have an empty bottle and you have some leftover chemicals, you can pour that in there, solvents especially. So sometimes we do that with solvents. We'll pour them back into an empty solvent bottle, and then we'll make sure that it's properly labeled, and um, it can be used for disposal purposes. However, you never want to fill up more than two-thirds of a bottle uh, for disposal purposes. The reason is the bottle gets warm, okay, and there's no air in there to absorb the expansion of the liquid. It could break the bottle and cause a chemical spill. So flammables or solvents, those are, you know, things like acetone and methanol and things like that should only be used in the solvent bench or flammable bench. And the photoresist spin hood. Okay, solvent benches are typically stainless steel. Never use a hot plate on a solvent bench without first removing all solvents from the work area with flash points within 20 degrees Celsius of the hot plate temperature. Um, we did have a have an incident in Albuquerque where, in a small clean room, someone was using um, either a hot plate or an infrared heater to heat some solution. Unfortunately, the solution got within 20 degrees of the flash point, and some kind of ignition source caused it to start burning. Burnt down the the, um, the laboratory they were working in. So. Knowing your flashpoints is important. Also, being around when you're using stuff and not leaving it on its own is important. Okay, um, don't work over maximum temperatures on any hot process. Never use an infrared heat source near a solvent. This is a lesson to learn. So, what is a flashpoint? Flashpoint, the lowest temperature at which vapors above a volatile combustible substance Ignite in air when exposed to an ignition source. So you can imagine the flash point of gasoline is really low. Gasoline is super easy to light, even in you know 20 degree below um, temperature. It'll get to a point where it's really hard to light because there's not enough vapor, right, to sustain a flame. So that that's a case where the flash point is extremely low. Any spark or flame. Well, of course, you never want to mix solvents and corrosives. 
okay? That can cause a lot of problems. You never pour excess chemicals back in the stock bottle. I already mentioned that. This will contaminate the stock bottle. Always use proper personal equipment when working with solvents. Appropriate personal protective equipment for most solvents include safety glasses, latex or nitrile gloves, and a ventilation hood. So when you see me stripping photoresist and acetone, I'll wear the triple trionic gloves, okay, and work under under the solid hood, fume hood. And that's fine. Um, if it's a corrosive, then you want complete gear. Acids and bases are very very um, dangerous to people's skin. Okay, when cleaning photoresist, you want to use the triple trionic gloves over your latex or nitrile gloves. Acetone has a tendency to um, dissolve latex and to a lesser extent nitrile. So your, your cleaner gloves will start to get sticky, right, if you get acetone on them. Triple trionic gloves are made from a combination of natural rubber, nitrile, and neoprene. So the combination of those three materials make it a pretty, pretty good chemically inert. All right, so how do you dispose of things? Well, you never ever aspirate any flammable chemicals. You can aspirate acids and bases, but not flammables or solvents, okay? Solvents and flammables are collected in the appropriate container. Those are the red containers, okay? We have one underneath the solvent bench, and we actually pour our excess acetone into it, and when it gets full, uh, Mark or Richard will take care of it and, and dispose of it. Okay, we only fill up bottles 75% of the total volume. We cap and label bottles' contents on waste management label. 25% air gap allows for the expansion of the liquid to reduce the risk of the bottle bursting. So the, the air in there will will take up the brunt of, of the pressure. Contact lab personnel for disposal. You guys will never have to do that. Items will be incinerated at a proper disposal site. So that's typically how you get rid of hazardous waste. You just burn it at a super high temperature and all the, all the um, chemical bonds will start breaking. You can dispose of the wipes containing sol solvents and flammables in only the red flammable waste containers. When returning chemicals to storage, which might happen if you only use half a gallon or so, always store chemicals in the proper locations. Solvents go in the solvent bench underneath. Corrosives go in the corrosives cabinet. Never put acetone, a solvent, in a corrosive cabinet. Right? Because uh, solvents and, and corrosives don't play nice together. Don't put sulfuric acid in the flammable. Um, if you need to transport a bottle of chemicals from one bay to another, either use the bottle carrier or the chemical cart. Make sure you have been briefed by our staff on the proper uh, method of moving chemicals. So we do have chemical carts. So if you want to move like three or four bottles from one bay to another, you can put them in the chemical cart and then roll the cart. Okay. If you do not use a bottle carrier or chemical cart, you may carry bottles, but you need to use two hands. So you have one hand on the handle, one hand on, on the bottom of the base. So stay. Only UNM staff or properly licensed contractors are allowed to replace any gas bottles. So don't mess with our process gases. If you run out of the gas and you need to have a bottle exchanged, let us know. We'll do it as soon as we can. Okay? Always follow proper protocols when working with gases. Never mix gases or chemicals that are compatible. Always wear protective equipment to reduce your risk of energy and injury and to yourself. So we actually have professionals um, that work with this stuff all the time, replace our more dangerous gases that are kept out in the gas bunker. Things like silane, um, methane, uh, ammonia, those are the kind of gases that um, we generally have someone else exchange the bottles for us. Silane is especially dangerous because when silane hits the air, it's pyrophoric. So a pyrophoric gas means that it ignites immediately when it comes in contact with air. It doesn't need an ignition source. You don't have to. Part 5. 
general cleaner. So no walking with open containers. So you don't fill up a beaker and then carry it from one station to another. Okay. Uh, so never do that. You can put it on a chemical cart and move it that way if you have to. Um, but usually we mix chemicals at the point that we're using it in the in the hood that we're using it at. Uh, you always want to look for trip trip hazards, um, wet areas when entering the lab environment. Always look around. Use your nose. You smell something funny. Something funny is going on, and you definitely don't want to hang around until it's determined what that smell is coming from. You don't screw around. You don't sneak up on someone and go boo. Okay? Never, never, never in a chemical uh, processing area. It's always serious, right? I mean, you can tell a joke or whatever, but please do not do something to either distract someone or startle someone. Know where the safety showers are and the eye washes are. So try to get a mental picture of where they are so that if you happen to close your eyes because you've got something in them, you'll be able to find the eye wash. Okay? Um, hopefully you'll have a partner with you, you're supposed to, when you're working with chemicals, and they can help guide you. Know where the emergency exits are and how to operate them in an emergency situation. That's usually pretty straightforward. You just push on it. First aid kits are also available in the gowning room and in the south aisle, and we'll show you that. You can see it in this image over here. If we zoom in on it, okay, we have our AED. So that's our automatic electronic defibrillator. This is our CPR kit. Um, and then we have the sodium gluconate. I believe that's behind here. And then a standard first aid kit. So if you get a little cut, right, you can go ahead and get a Band-Aid out of here. If you have a headache, I think we have Tylenol or ibuprofen or something in there. You know, feel free to use it. Mark typically looks at it every once in a while and refills it. All right. Some more general safety information. If you're working on the solvent bench and the CO2 fire suppression system is activated, get out of the lab as safely and as quickly as possible. Make sure your lab partner is with you. So in the picture on the right here, that's the fire suppression system. Okay, so it's got a, a valve on it that's hooked up to the um, sensing system for fire. So it'll go, it'll turn on on its own. You want to definitely leave the fab if that happens and go to the emergency assembly point, which we talked about earlier. Okay, it floods the clean room as well as the surface service chases with CO2 and high concentrations of CO2 is dangerous to breathe. It can Things you can't do in the, in the clean room. Don't answer your phone, okay, without first rinsing and drying your gloves. So if your phone rings, you don't want to put it next to your face, especially if you've been working with things that have gotten on your gloves. <coughs> you can go on the south aisle or the gowning room to answer your phone or call the person back. Some of you may be expecting very important calls. Um, then, of course, you replace your gloves uh, once you've, you've done your call. Um, you cannot leave the bay wearing triple trionic gloves. If you're wearing triple trionic gloves, you've been working with chemicals. You may have chemicals on those gloves. If you touch a doorknob, you will transfer that chemical to the, to the doorknob. If someone else touching the doorknob will get that chemical transferred to their clean room gloves if they're wearing them. Sometimes clean room rub, um, gloves break and you have to go back and replace them. So, you know, you've lost that layer of protection. So you never, ever leave the bay wearing safety gear. You stay in the bay. You do not get on a computer and type anything wearing safety gear or the, the acid gear because you can cross-contaminate the keyboard, the chair that you're sitting in, that sort of thing. 
So you stand in front of the workstation and don't touch anything else except the things you're working with at the workstation, at the acid or caustic bench. Okay? Do not um, cross-contaminate with any other equipment that others might be using. The buddy system. We always should have a buddy. Okay, here you see... Um, one of my students coaching another one of my students on how to use the aspirator. And um, that's really good because he's got a buddy, but there's something wrong about this picture. Can you think of what it is? Well, he's standing a little too close to this individual. If something happens here, he's not protected. So typically, if you're coaching someone, you should stand further back, two to three feet. First, you explain everything to them before they start so they understand what they're doing. You know, they, you can show them how to, or they can go through the process without chemicals until they understand the procedure, and then they can do it with chemicals. Okay? So that's the only thing wrong with this picture. Okay, tool usage. Never use a tool you're not qualified to use. So we train you on equipment. We have to qualify you on equipment. Okay, training is available upon request. Those paying customers we have, we only charge you one hour for training, even if it takes six days. Okay, the reason is, is uh, safety is important and proper use of the equipment is important. So we'll train you for however long it takes until you're comfortable with what you're doing and we're comfortable with what you're doing. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Sometimes you get trained on a piece of equipment, you use it a few times, and then it might be four months later, you come back and do another experiment using that equipment. If that's the case, you probably would want a refresher course or at least someone's there with you to coach you through the steps to make sure you don't do something that will uh, risk you, risk your product, or risk the equipment. Uh, never attempt to fix any machine that's broken or not functioning right by yourself. You will tell Mark and Richard that the machine's not functioning right and they will repair it or take or get the people in that need to be in to repair it. Okay? Uh, shut off facilities only if, you, if it is unsafe for the tool to have the facilities connected. And always let us know. So if something's smoking, you can unplug it. Right, that's what we mean there. Okay, and push the email button. It's an electrical. If anything's broken or wires are exposed or anything like that, please contact the uh, lab personnel immediately. Um, if we're not directly around and, and something's not working right, leave a note. You know, the exposure tool um, seems to not function properly, uh, the shutter is not working right or not consistent. And then put your name on the note so that we can follow up with you and say, okay, what exactly is it doing? Okay, don't lean or bump against equipment. Um, there could be chemicals on the equipment. That would be one reason why you don't want to lean against anything in the clean room. The other reason is, is we have what we call email buttons. Those are emergency uh, machine off buttons. It's basically like pulling the plug. Those are designed in case someone's getting electrocuted. You hit the email button and it shuts power down to the tool. You do not want to use the email button to turn a tool off. That's not what it's for. Um, improper um, shutdown of a tool can damage it. Of course, when someone's life's at risk, we don't care. We want to save the person's life. So be aware of where the emergency off buttons are. Some of them are kind of low, right? Um, some of them are high up. So it's easy to bump into them. So if you think you may have tripped an email button by accident, please let us know and right away so that we can make sure that the machine comes back to life. So here are some 
chemo buttons. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go through that. So here's one. This is the perylene coder. You can see this is at a very low level. Okay, that's the emo button right there. Emergency off button. So um, that's, you know, probably not a great place to have it. Here's another one. This is on the spin rinse dryer. Okay, you can see that the emo button here has got a shroud around it. This was probably done. You can see this was an aftermarket thing. This was probably done because people, you know, accidentally pushed this button too many times. So by putting a shroud around it, then if you bump it, it won't go off. You have to actually take your finger and push in on it. Okay, and you'll see that modification on a lot of tools um, in the clean room. Here's another emo button. This one's kind of high up on the sink. So chances of hitting it are pretty low. This one, however, is on our deep reactive ion etcher. And you can see the problem here. This button is about the same height as a chair. And I believe one time we had a, a workshop and someone bumped into this and shut the tool down. We didn't even know it. And that caused some damage to the power supply. Okay. So, yes, you want to use that if someone's getting electrocuted, but otherwise, you don't really want to push those buttons. Okay? So, those are some examples of emergency off buttons. Emergency. All right. So, waste disposal. That's something we're real picky about. You don't want to mix wastes and cause um, chemical instability. So you want to dispose of waste in its proper location. Corrosives go in the con uh, corrosive contaminated materials such as wipes, acid gloves, etc. go in the white corrosive disposal container. So what's a corrosive? Well, it's a material that is highly reactive and causes obvious damage to living tissue. So that's an acid in the base, right? So lye, things you pour down the drain to clean the drains like Drano, that's actually uh, sodium hydroxide. Um, you get that on your skin, it'll burn you, right? We use uh, potassium hydroxide, which will do the same thing to your skin, to etch crystalline silicon. So corrosives can act either directly by chemically destroying the part through oxidation or indirectly by causing an inflammation. Acids and bases are common corrosive materials. Corrosives such as these are also sometimes referred to as caustics. So if we say caustics, that's an acid or a base or something contaminated with an acid or a base. Okay, so we have acidic corrosives such as hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. We use that as well. Typical examples of basic corrosives are sodium hydroxide and lime. And what we call developer is a base. Flammable contaminated materials such as wipes and eyedroppers, we don't, we don't use eyedroppers or pipettes, um, those sorts of things uh, go in the red flammable waste containers. So those waste containers actually have a metal lid on them. And it goes back to the old days when they used to take, um, you know, ashes out of your uh, furnace or whatever and put them in a, a metal can, right, so you wouldn't spread the fire. And then they've started putting metal lids on it. Solvents and organic waste go in the red and flammable waste containers. So photoresist is actually an organic with a solvent in it. Okay, regular non-contaminated waste such as paper and pens and plastic and wrappings and things like that go in the stainless steel containers. The reason we want to keep that separate is disposing of contaminated waste is more expensive to have that carried away. Um, we don't want to mix. We don't want to mix different types of chemicals. Sharps, which are sharp things that can that can cut you, like broken glassware, for example, or broken wafers, which is more common in our clean room. They can be as sharp as razor blades, so they go in the red and white sharps container. There's no exception to that. So if we have a broken wafer, even if it has photoresist on it, it goes in the red and, and white container of a sharps. This is so that everybody knows you don't reach into that container because it will. 
So here is a, a list of our common disposal um, uh, waste containers that we have in the clean room. The caustics are white. We now have new caustic um, waste containers with a foot pedal to open up the top. So if you have a little, if you're carrying or holding a contaminated wipe, you don't have to touch the, the lid. Um, in the middle there is the red um, solvent or flammable waste container. You can see it also has a foot pedal and a lid on it to, and it's steel. So if there's a fire that starts inside of it, it won't spread. And then lastly, we have our stainless steel traditional last, uh, waste containers for, you know, paper and plastic and things like that, non-contaminated systems. NFPA labels and symbols is something you're going to be tested on. These are the National Fire Protection Agency um, standards. Okay, blue is for health. If you have a zero, that means it's not a risk to your health. And if you have a four, it means it's very risky to your health. So the numbers go from zero to four. Flammable is red. Think of a fire truck, right? Flammable is red. Blue is health again. Think of your lips turning blue if you're not breathing, okay? Uh, yellow is reactivity, okay? So reactive materials are things that will react. So oxygen is considered reactive, okay? Then you have the white um, diamond. The white is for special instructions. So you can have things in there like the W with a line through it. That means don't use water. So when firemen see this, a W with a line through it, they know not to use water on that fire. They'll use foam or something else because the water will make it worse. Okay? Uh, you can put a radioactive symbol in there, a biohazard symbol, a corrosive symbol in there. And that just gives the emergency response people an idea of what, how to treat a problem or a, or a spill. Okay? So you should remember, you know, zero to four, four being the worst. Blue, health. Uh, red is flammability. Um, yellow is reactivity. And white is for special instructions. So that's actually a question on the. So we're OSHA compliant. We like to be uh, provide a safe working environment for our customers, our student researchers, our professors. So we're OSHA compliant. So OSHA stands for Occupational Safety Health Administration. It's federal. We also are overseen by the state. Um, the state is called SHEA, which is um, State Health Environmental Agency. Okay, so we never work in an unsafe environment. If you feel that it's an unsafe environment, leave. Then tell us why you think it's unsafe. Always use pro proper personal protective equipment. And this goes for other companies you work for in the future and also at home if you're working with any kind of account. Report on safe work conditions or work habits immediately to lab personnel. So if you notice someone doing something and they're not following um, proper protocol, coach them. Say, hey, by the way, you know you should be wearing a face shield. And if they say, you know, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing, then let us know, right? Because if they're working unsafely, then it makes it unsafe for all of us. Uh, always know how to get out of the place in the event of an emergency. So think about that. You know, think about how am I going to get out of here? Uh, always be aware of your surroundings, right? Mostly to keep you from tripping into something or accidentally brushing against you know, a beaker with chemicals in it and that sort of thing. I use proper safety devices and interlocks when we're working on, on high voltage equipment, which you're not going to do, but our, our staff does. And, you know, they always have some sort of interlock and they triple check and make sure everything is turned off. And they also tell each other they're going to work on this. And that other person looks it over and says, okay, yeah, it's safe. And you've unplugged it, you've turned off the circuit breaker and all. Okay, we're in our last part of this long lecture and uh, safety briefing. It's far from brief, you may think, but we have a, a little bit of an, a fun thing and a, and a thing to go over 
you know, what's wrong with this picture? So this is based on actual things we've seen in the clean room in the past. So we staged some shots. Our model in this wonderful set of photographs is Mark Hoffheins. He's one of our techs. Um, he has a very long white beard, typically. He's also a balloon pilot. And, uh, you know, he was generous enough to give me some of his time so I could. So what do you think? Is this okay? You know, he's carrying some chemicals in his hand. What's wrong with this picture? Well, one, carrying a bottle under your armpit is not proper protocol. You need to use two hands. If you're not using a chemical cart or carrier, you're going to use two hands to, ca to carry this bottle. So one hand will be around the neck, something like this, and then his other hand will be at the base. Um, he's also carrying chemical gloves in his hand. I don't know if these have been used or not. If they've been used, then he's cross-contaminating his hand. Probably not a good idea. So here's Mark in front of our new um, hydrofluoric vapor etch system. Okay, we're setting this up. He's working with the uh, equipment. He's got a wafer here ready to etch. So can you name some things that are wrong with this picture? Think about it. Well, working with chemicals, you have to wear proper um, personal protective equipment. So he doesn't have a face shield. He doesn't have his glasses over his eyes. The only time you can take your safety glasses and and wear them on the top of your head like this is if you happen to be looking into a microscope. Sometimes you have to do that to use a microscope. But as soon as you turn away from that microscope, those glasses go back on and cover your eyes. Okay, so his glasses are up, not covering his eyes. He has triple trionic gloves on, but he doesn't have an acid um, apron, no caustic apron, and he doesn't have a face shield. Okay, so he's working on a chemical bench. He has to wear the chemical gear. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, there's a couple of things. One, you may say his face shield is up. Well, in this case, that doesn't matter because he's not doing any chemical work at the moment. But the real thing is, is he's coming in or out of the bay wearing chemical gear. So if he had been working on a chemical um, bench, his apron could be contaminated, his gloves could be contaminated, opening the door, rubbing against the door can cross-contaminate the door, and someone who's not wearing chemical protective equipment could rub up against and get it on themselves. They could touch the doorknob, get it on their on their gloved hands, and it's very easy. Everybody wants to scratch their face, right, while they're working, um, and it's something you don't think about. So what can happen in this scenario? We've got Mark standing kind of away from the bench, but he's not touching any other equipment or anything. His shield is up. That might be okay if he's not directly working with chemicals at the time. But this is the dangerous thing right here. He's got a triple trionic glove holding his cell phone. So he's cross-contaminated, potentially, his cell phone, and now he's putting it to his face, close to his eye, you know, skin contact, so you can have um, transference of, of toxic materials from this glove to your face. So you definitely don't want to do that. Never scratch your face wearing triple trionic gloves. Um, you know, typically, you know, you want to keep that shield down. So if you go, you know, in a reactive mode, try to touch your face, um, you'll, you'll run into your, your face shield and it'll remind you that, oh, I don't want to touch. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, he's got his gear on, right? He's got his triple trionic gloves. Uh, I don't seem to be over his sleeve as well as it should be like this hand. 
So you do want to make sure your triple trionic gloves go over the sleeve. All right, he's got his acid gear on. It's tied in the back. Maybe you should tie it here as well. Keep it less open. Okay, but this is the main thing right here. His shield is up. So you want to put the shield down before you work on anything in the in the caustic bench. This, by the way, is the caustic bench. We do our developing in this bench. Okay. So do you see any problems with this picture? Well, what's the rule? You're not allowed to touch anything other than things at the acid or at the caustic bench. You cannot touch a keyboard with triple trionic gloves. Okay, let's zoom in on this, right? So he's got his triple trionic gloves on, which could be contaminated. And now he's working on a keyboard to look something up on the computer. So, you know, again, that's not a good thing. Plus, his smock may be cross-contaminating the seat, and you could get it on your clothes, and that's not a good thing either. So make sure you do not cross-contaminate anything if you're wearing um, acid. So we're almost done. I uh, just want to let you know we do have a uh, security camera system. So for security reasons, there's several, several cam cameras that are constantly filming what's going on in the fab. This is so in the event of something catastrophic happening or someone breaking into the clean room, you know, we have video evidence of that. Or if an accident occurs, we can look at the video and try to find out what happened so we can reduce the probability of it happening again. And we also use it to um, confirm whether or not someone was following safety protocols. Okay, so please make sure that you follow the rules. And if you don't understand something, you've got to ask us. We're here to help. We, we're here to keep. So if we were doing a live lecture, you'd be able to ask me questions. Since this is a recorded one, you can email me um, or you can call me. Uh, you'll be in contact with me, I'm Matt Plyle, uh, if you're going to be allowed into the clean room. Um, and if you have any doubt about anything, you can ask one of us or somebody else in the clean room that's been working there for a while. Uh, you know, Mark and Richard are there to help you. Um, they're very cool people. They know a lot of stuff. You can ask them about equipment and processing and, and their experiences working at Intel and at Phillips Semiconductors and what it was like working in, in those environments. Um, you know, you can learn a lot from, from them. I, I always do. Every week I learn something from those guys. So, so when in doubt, ask questions. Thank you. I hope this was informative and I hope you passed the test.